It's on, right? Okay, so hello. Hello, hello. Okay. Okay, so um it's uh it's four o'clock like actually five minutes past four o'clock and people are still joining in uh, both by a, a zoom as well as joining in in the auditorium here in lecture theater so um i would like to welcome all of you uh, for this edition of the nsf wednesday colloquium and um, it's actually our honor and pleasure to have to welcome back one of our own professor shunando banerji uh, who has come back again to TFR and uh, is going to give a talk. He was part of us, uh, you know, not many years back. Um, and uh, it's actually our pleasure to host him again. Um, just for everybody's sake, the NSF Colloquium uh, has traditionally been, uh, uh, you know, an event where all the members of the Natural Sciences faculty come together um, for one lecture in a week. And that allows for you know, building connections between physicists, chemists, and biologists um, through the lecture or, you know, uh, just th the discussions after the lecture. So this this idea was actually a brainchild of uh, uh, Professor Homi Bhabha and our first director. So it has continued and, and as a tradition in our institute for all these years. Um, so I will like to actually call in Professor Gobindo Majundar to um, introduce, formally introduce Professor Shunando Banerjee. So welcome all of you. And Professor Banerjee does not need introduction, slightly older generation people, but I'll try to tell a little bit about, I'll take his little time. So this title is the 50 years of experimental high energy physics. Actually, this is not this roughly, it is exactly 50 years back in 1972, he started his career in Imperial College and his PhD was on this bubble chamber in the Rutherford lab searching for this very one. And then subsequently he spent lots of time in this different kind of bubble chamber experiment. And so in between, in 1978, he came to TIFR with the bubble chamber experiment and then in the, after that, he went to the cello experiment in Daisy for a year, come back here and he take the lead role of the L3 experiment in CM, L3 experiment. And in again, in 1994 or 95 onwards, he take this lead role in the CMS experiment. And I recall actually in the 2001, we went to KEK to propose our Bill participations. Uh, that's all also he was he was there and I was with him. Okay. So this is his this uh, okay in the short, okay, in the short word that what is the different experiment he was involved. But I just try to take you these few points explicitly. Okay, I do not know many of the things, but something I know. So let's for example, he is the author and the developer of the GN3, GN4 software from the inception of the GN code. And still he is maintaining, and he is still the maintaining the CMS calibration course. And actually day before he was spending, I saw the two, two hours time with the student to how to run the code or he write the code himself, what I saw him 30 years back when I joined as a student. And he has the same spirit till now. So that's the one part. Second thing is that we do not know. He is in known field in the, all over the world. So I know on this few example, let's for example, like 2003, a BS experiment in Beijing, uh, they found that their experimental results was not matching with this old sphere and other experimental results. And they were clueless what went wrong. And they called him to look for what is there inside the software or the detectors, what are the problem. 
so it's like l3 bell or b a uh, big european bubble chamber this is his collaboration he did but these are the extra things also he was helping all the other people and other thing i just say that this cms detector the scale calibration uh, this is the his brain child as he is continuing with that that i told you and just uh, one, two more things i just added uh, there's l3 experiment when starting from this concept of the software design complete software simulation and reconstruction was he was the one of the main person who ran through over this l3 period similarly for the cms experiment starting from the 94 and 95 he was the person who was he developed and still now he was this overall in charge of this simulation this detector geometry and simulation things and also let's say in cms when we started uh, before the cms start so this which which detect material is suitable for the calorimeter that time cms was not there but in the lc environment which detector is supposed to be the best and there is a crystal clear collaboration is formed sir and he was in india is one of the person leading to the indian group to choose this material and what is the size and shape of the detectors so this is the multi facet i will he will tell it only i am saying that this is not the just this what 50 years this is exactly his experience in 50 years of energy physics that he will tell us to know that Can you hear me better? Uh, I was yes, asked to write an article about uh, experimental high energy physics post. Uh, well, I think when the electroweak in unification uh, took place, and I chose the starting point as my most favorite experiment. So, and that experiment took place in 1971 72 so that's why okay this 50 years started okay this is not my life i i only it's a, it only coincided with my life in high experiment in high physics but it is not my uh, contribution to experiment in high physics for that period anyway let me start Well, I think uh, what high energy physics does, it looks for the fundamental constituents of matter and their interactions, and it follows essentially the principle which is said by this gentleman. Okay, I mean you obviously know him. He says I attach more value to finding a fact even about the slightest thing than to long disputations about the greatest questions that fail to lead to any truth whatsoever. And that's really the separates out philosophy from modern science. And essentially, I am trying to basically talk about uh, this particular philosophy of Galileo okay, for following up okay, what we have learned about high energy physics over the past 50 years. Now, we jump from the 16th century to 1960s or end of 1960s. And the, in the decade of 60s, we ended up with a lot of promises in the field of high energy physics. Uh, there were discovery of a large number of hadrons like protons, neutrons, pions, kaons, and so on and so forth. And that led to the idea that these child, uh, strong interacting particles, which are called hadrons, are not fundamental particles, but they're made out of some fundamental constituents, and one of the gentlemen called Gelman, okay, I mean, he said, okay, these constituents are called quarks. At the same time, okay, I mean, in the 60s, okay, there, there was an experiment which is probing the protons with electrons, and that 
or they almost like a Rutherford experiment in the beginning of the century, 20th century, where they got the evidence of point like constituents called protons or partons. This is a theory which was given by uh, Richard Feynman. So these are the things which were there, which I mean, at the uh, beginning of, uh, at the end of 1960s. And uh, from the theoretical prejudices, there are, theory, there are two theories. Okay, one theory is for the electromagnetic interaction and one theory for weak interaction. They look very similar, okay. So they wanted to have a unified theory okay, for, of electro, electromagnetic and weak interactions. But there are several ways to unify them and each needing an existing of some yet to be discovered particle. Then there were many symmetries which were found to be exact, but there are some which are violated, but by a very tiny amount. So these are the things which were there. And, and finally, okay, there are, we had the final, the constituents which are called quarks and leptons, and they're found in two generations. That means you have one set, and this is repeating itself to a similar one, but with the different masses and uh, for that. But there are only four types of leptons and only three types of quarks. So the way to move forward at this stage is to make new experimental observation. And this is how the whole thing started in the beginning of 70s. Now to move forward, uh, we need the technology to advance. So first of all, okay, we are working in, the, in those days at an energy of the order of few, uh, but I would say, okay, I mean, 10 tens of GeV, okay, I mean, not more than that. But to energy, increase the energy scale, the experiment has to move from uh, a beam of particles hitting a fixed target to two beams of particles colliding with each other. And so we, this is the thing, okay, and this started with the, electron positron storage ring on an experimental basis in Italy and with a proton proton collider ISR at CERN. In fact, when I was doing my PhD in the very first year, the very first results of ISR was presented in the uh, Royal Society. And that was my first excitement to come in to attend the meeting and to listen to the speakers of the ISR experiment. To uh, then the next thing is that we want to observe rare events, okay. In, in the past, okay, I mean, the, the events which were happening, okay, in abundance, they're the only ones which were observed. Now, to observe rare events, we have to move away from visual detection techniques to electronic devices. In the early days, the detection techniques utilized nuclear emulsions, uh, bubble chambers, spark chambers, where, where things are photographed so that you can visually see the things so that you can believe what you are seeing. But you have to move away from that if you want to look at the rare events. And then the next thing is to do, you have to produce intense beams of particles which are, uh, you have to improve the focusing techniques. Finally, when you are trying to analyze, okay, you have to utilize new analysis techniques for doing that. First of all, okay, I mean, you are not want to see every event, but you want to trigger the occurrences of something you'd like to see. So the triggering and sophisticated algorithms were developed. You have to use what you call a detector simulation and visualization because you have moved away from the visual inspection of the event occurrence. So you have to utilize computers to look at the things which, which is being produced. And finally, we have to employ artificial intelligence. The two, I just give two prominent names okay, in this. This gentleman is Simon van der Meer. He has done an enormous thing in the field of accelerator physics. Uh, he has done, uh, made the uh, experiment to have intense neutrino beams using the magnetic horn. He has made the antiproton proton colliders using the cooling the antiprotons using the stochastic cooling and so on and so forth. Okay, there's numerous things he has done. And this gentleman is George Chartback, who has made a revolution in the field of detectors 
And there are many others who have done lots of things in the detection technique, but I uh, singled out only one person, this is Charpa, who has made the multiple proportional chamber, drift chamber, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, the first experiment, that is the experiment which I say the uh, one of the real key experiment in the field is uh, this so-called discovery of neutral current. Now, I, I mentioned the unification of the theories of electromagnetic and weak interactions needed the existence of a new particle. It could be a heavy charged lepton or it could be a neutral vector boson. This is a uh, model due to uh, Georgie Glashow and this is a model due to Weinberg and Salam. Now, searches were on for on these particles for both of them. A good place to look for heavy electrons was electron positron colliders. I'll come to some discoveries in electron positron colliders soon. But a good place to look for neutral vector boson is uh, which is coupled to weak interactions. So, this is an experiment where you have uh, particles which are weakly interacting, and that is neutrino beams. Now, neutrino beams were proposed by these two gentlemen, Bruno. Pontecarvo and Melvin Schwartz, and they are produced through the decays of charged pions and kaons. Now, I won't say a story about that, okay, but uh, eventually, the, the, one of the first experiments was done at Brookhaven Laboratory using them, which already showed two types of neutrinos. So that was already done. Now, to uh, really look for neutral current, we need an intense neutrino beam which could be produced uh, using the technique by Simon van der Meer using the so-called magnetic horn, which was done at CERN. Now, during the 60s, okay, I mean, uh, CERN, uh, this gentleman, Colin Graham, built a 1.2 meter heavy liquid bubble chamber, and they exposed to neutrino beams. In fact, okay, I mean, after that in 63, in the Siena conference, they thought, okay, they will discover something new, okay, but they only observed very few events were observed to provide evidence, anything new. But it demonstrated that this is the right technology for future experiments. So, right at that conference, this is the Siena conference, this gentleman is Andre Lagerik. He proposed a second generation large bubble chamber which to be filled up with a heavy, uh, heavy liquid, which is prion. This was conceived in 1963. It took some years okay, to build the uh, bubble chamber. This is this particular bubble chamber here. This was installed uh, at CERN in 1970, and they had the first beam with the neutrinos in 1971. Bu bu bubble chamber is essentially uses a superheated liquid, but they're confined in a way that there is, it is a heated liquid, but it does not boil. Then you change the pressure on the uh, thing so that you can, when the charged particle goes to that, they give enough energy deposits along its path so that the bubbles can be formed. So what happens is that when you, when the bubbles are formed above a certain radius, you take a photograph. So you so, know that the, the particle has hit it has gone through that, and if it is interacted, obviously the topology of the trajectory will change. It not only built the chamber, but he also made a European collaboration. And at that time, the, we had a so-called a large collaboration, and this large collaboration consisted of a forty to fifty people. This is not large up to today's standard, but it was very large in in those days. Because I, my thesis experiment was done with a collaboration of 10 people, okay? So, so the search was on for neutral current. That means the neutrino will interact with the matter in the bubble chamber, and it will give rise to a neutrino in the final state. Normally, the neutrinos uh, interact and give rise to a muon, and that is a, to an exchange of a, uh, some sort of a charge mediator. So neutral current will not give rise to anything. So the whole idea is that it will give rise to an interaction of this sort. Neutrinos coming in from this direction, and you will have several things which are 
hadrons which will be produced. And you can see, okay, I mean, this particle comes in uh, and interacts here, or uh, you can see interacts here, or it decays here. So, so these are the things, okay, which are hadrons which are produced. So obviously, okay, this is a, uh, a muonless event. Now, it is not just neutrinos will be coming, there will be also some background things will be coming, which are neutrons. So they have to distinguish, okay, this is a interaction with a neutrino or an interaction with a neutron. So one of the first thing they did is they had some sort of a handmade Monte Carlo study for doing that. The main difference of a neutron in induced interaction and the neutrino in in induced interaction is that the cross section for neutrons with matter is much larger than the cross section of the probability of interaction of uh, neutrinos with matter. So all the neutrons will interact in the very front of the chamber and whereas the uh, vertical distribution for the ne neutrinos will be almost throughout the chamber. So they looked at the so-called neutron stars and this is the uh, profile as a function of distance along the uh, beam. And you can see it is uh, very large at the, it's very large at the beginning and it falls off sharply okay towards the end. Uh, the other thing which is there is that the neutrons have a, a lower energy, so the in, total energy of this thing is much lower, and that's how they separate the things. Now, so what what is being done is that they try to look at the neutrino beams and the antineutrino beams, and they looked at the uh, muon uh, muon events and muon less events, and uh, which is they call charge current and nuclear current events, and they saw that the distributions of the along the beam line, okay, they are very, very similar. And also the lateral distributions of these uh, interactions are also very, very, very similar. So they're convinced that these are really neutrino induced events and that, and without any muons with that. So that's what they uh, published their first paper. But then in the same time, okay, they also have a very clinching evidence came from uh, an event like this where the antineutrinos which comes in, okay, I mean, is an antineutrino beam experiment, it produces a single electron by interacting with a, uh, electrons in the, uh, in the at atomic structure of the thing. So these two really discovered the so-called uh, neutral current. But the story is not that simple. There were also neutrino beams at Fermi Lab and this gentleman, uh, he's a well-known guy, okay, his name is Carlo Rubia. He was having a collaboration called HPWF, okay, this is a Howard, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin formula collaboration. And this claimed observation and then non-observation of the neutral currents. So it went on for some time. So this led to the idea of alternate currents. And obviously the Gargamel experiment never received its due recognition. So Andre Lagerding died without being recognized, okay, that he was a discoverer of neutral current. But uh, uh, I would say HPWF experiment got his reward as well. In the year 1974, in the Rochester Conference in London, I heard Carlo Rubia showed evidence of this type of events, which are dimion events. Later on, this said, but he did not really claim it to be of any given type. He just showed the dimion events and that's all. These are the first indication of charm particles. He did not claim for that. So he did not get the recognition that he discovered charm particles. I, I think it was the right recognition, right prize of okay, Carlo Rubia had okay, for claiming these alternate currents. Uh, the, the thing is, okay, I mean, in 19, uh, 74 itself, okay, I mean, that happened in 1974 summer. In October 74, the two experiments uh, came up with an observation of a very narrow state with mass around 3.1 GTGV. So this gentleman is uh, Sam, Sam Ting. He tries, to, he always tries to do experiments with detectors of very high uh, precision. So he would design an experiment with uh, at Brookhaven National Laboratory, where he was looking at a dielectron production in a uh, hadron uh, nucleus collision. So he was having uh, the beams uh, from the Brookhaven National Laboratory at 30 GeV hitting a target, and he had 
a double arm spectrometer where you had the identification system for the electrons and also measured the momentum of the uh, uh, of the two electrons, electrons and positrons. And what he showed is that he showed a sharp peak as 3.1 GV. Now he is a very uh, what you call uh, conservative experimentalist. So he wanted to make a number of checks which are performed to see if it is a uh, artifact of some defect of the detectors or it is a genuine effect. So he did lots of ch changes. And after seeing this thing, he really waited for nearly one year before he came up and claimed it. Yeah. Electrons and position coming from a single interaction of a proton beam hitting a nucleus target. And you looked at the effective mass of this thing, and if you see a peak, that means okay, we have identified an object of that. The importance of this is that this particular peak, I mean, this we have observed number of resonances in the past, but the main thing is that this particular resonance is very, very narrow. Hmm? Ruby was looking at this. Thing. Was you showed the. It was a. It was essentially a neutrino experiment. Neutrino. Yeah. Neutrino beam on a fixed target. Neutrino beam on a fixed target. Uh, this was. He was not the only one who saw this. Uh, saw this. There were experiments were done. Uh, by the way, Ting's experiment has a. 10 to 12 people in the collaboration. It was not a large collaboration. It was very small collaboration from that point of view. This exp this particular collaboration at Slack was a much larger collaboration, about 40 people. And this was done in a E plus E minus collider called Sphere. And what they did is that they tried to measure the cross section of electron positron colli uh, collision as a function of energy. So when it, they did the first scan of this thing, they found some a broad bump around 3.2 GV. So they came back who can took a very fine, as fine scan around the mass region where they had the broad bump and they saw a very narrow structure. And you can see it is a, uh, it is in E plus E minus going to E plus E minus, E plus E minus going to mu plus mu minus. Or this is a one, is, this one is to hadrons. This is in the mu plus mu minus and this is to E plus E minus. So in all these final states, okay, when you, you see a very sharp rise in the cross section at the same mass value. Now, the explanation of this sharp, uh, small cross section, a uh, small width, the narrow width of this thing was made by invoking uh, the suggestion of uh, these three gentlemen who tried to explain the narrow width of a, one of the resonances which was seen in the 60s called the phi meson. Now, phi meson consists of a pair of strange quarks, but it has a mass which is slightly larger than the mass of uh, k plus or k plus and k minus, which cons which has made out of a strange quark and some other quark, like either a u quark or a d quark. So, since it is, it has got a mass which is slightly larger than that. Okay, the we have got. Two things which comes in is what is called the matrix element, other is called the phase space. The phase space for the decay is small. So obviously, okay, I mean, that's why, okay, it, it phi has got a narrow width, but not as narrow width as this object. So this particular state in this case, okay, should consist of a pair of a new type of work and a, and the a meson which consists of a chunk, this quark, and an up-down anti-quark should have a masses which is larger than half the mass of this newly observed state. And that can really explain the narrow width. So obviously, okay, this is a bound state of a charm quark and charm antiquark. So yes, no. this resonance on the top of the previous. Yeah, this resonance is a rather asymmetric shape. Does it have any significance? Why? Uh, whenever we have uh, Anything okay? The, the thing is okay. I mean, uh, the production cross section. I, I'll show you the other thing. Huh? Yeah. 
No, no, it's the last one is P plus E minus. This is the hadron. The largest cross section is hadrons. This is mu muons, and this is E plus E minus. So, so I think that there is a, always a radiation, okay, which which uh, tries to broaden it at the higher end. That that makes it uh, asymmetric. I I show other places also for for that. Okay, I mean uh, where you have the uh, asymmetric uh, cross section. Now, soon after the discovery of JSI particle, obviously people will have to look at a worldwide hunt for open charm hadrons. Uh, I mean, uh, at Imperial College, we also started looking for that in the anti-proton proton collision, but we are not as lucky as the guys in the sphere. They collided uh, the same experiment, okay, they tried to look at the uh, uh, effective masses of a kion and a pion, and they saw a peak around uh, 1.85 uh, GV, which was the evidence of, of uh, uh, the first charm hadrons. But then there is a large set of programs with uh, very uh, uh, precise tracking detector, which is utilized silicons, and also high, high resolution bubble chamber, both at CERN and Fermilab. We studied the properties of charm hadrons during the 80s. The next thing which came up during the 70s is the discovery of a fifth type of lepton, I mean, a third type of charged lepton. Now, in the words, okay, I'll, I'll try to say <laughs> as loud as possible, okay. I, I know I, I'm a little bit limited, okay, by the volume of my voice. Now, in the, this is the words of uh, the discoverer of the tau lepton. He says, okay, the, there are three things which really led to the discovery, the connection between the electrons and the muon, that the development of electron positron storage ring, and finally, the development of the theory of sequential leptons. All these three ideas, okay, I mean, really, Led to the discovery of the new lepton. Now, it, he was uh, obviously okay. I mean, Slack was not the first place where the search of tau lepton was on. Uh, since the commissioning of the electron positron collider at Adone in Italy, scientists started looking for these events with electrons and muons of opposite charges. Unfortunately, the energy in Adone was not high enough, so experiments done at Adone could not find the evidence of this exotic particle. And in a series of paper, they gave a lower limits of the mass of any new sequential lepton. So the searches does not always lead to discoveries. It sometimes gives a, li a, a limit. And they gave a limit between 800 MP to 1.1 GP. But that did not stop Martin Pearl to look for uh, a new lepton in sphere. Now in sphere, I mean, the energy collider reached 3.8 GP. And he kept on looking for that, this is Martin Pearl. And he found, okay, in the thing, okay, I mean, you have got a clear candidate, okay, I mean, where you have got a muon, uh, which have a clean uh, trajectory in the tracking detector, and uh, uh, something on the muon, muon chamber, and an electron going in the opposite direction. I wanted to ask, the, the reason why they were looking for the third lepton, is that related to the Kobayashi Moscow paper or they were not aware of it? They were just looking. I think they were just looking. Okay. I mean, I don't think okay, it was not Kobayashi Moscow was not. Well, I think it, it had come in, in the 73, back of their mind. But I do probably, not know, okay, but uh, yeah. yeah. It was not well known at that time. No, it was not well known. It was Kobayashi Moscow was not. Well, uh, Kabibu's theory was established. But Kobayashi Mashka was not established at that time. No, but Kabibu is two by two. So you could have yeah, stopped, two, stopped yeah. with muon, electron and muon. Yeah, the quark yeah. mixing was established. But, yes. but again with Sham, that was closed in two generations. Yeah. The reason to look for a third generation does come from Kobayashi Mashka, but yeah, probably but it was Kobayashi not known Mashka at that time. Kobayashi was not at all established. In fact, I, mean, uh, it, I do not think even Kobayashi Mashka was known to this, this gentleman. Okay. I think the first experiment in the Adone was the uh, brainchild of Antonino Zikiki. Okay. So Antonino Zikiki did a lot more things other than, okay, I mean. Uh, well, well, he paid my salary. <laughs> <laughs> or mine. 
Okay. So, so these observations were followed by observations done in the electron hadron and the muon hadron events in uh, not just in sphere but also in Dodis in, in Hamburg. And the energy dependence of the cross section uh, for this type of events gave a measurement of the lepton mass and this lepton mass, I mean, this is the cross section uh, as a function of energy. And from that, okay, they derived, okay, the mass of the object. And this is a standard technique which was later on used, okay, in getting the mass of, for example, for W bosons in E, e plus E minus collision. Uh, during the late 80s, okay, I mean, I, I was talked about, okay, I mean, uh, the, the late 60s, okay, I mean, I talked about that uh, the deep industry scattering of electrons on protons demonstrated that the cross section depends only on some dimensionless quantity and not on the energy scale, okay. This was called Bjorken scaling, and this really led to the idea of partons as the point like constituents of protons and all hadrons. Uh, now, with the advent of high energy neutrino beams from the super proton synchrotron at CERN, several experiments were proposed in the waste area uh, to study the goodness of the scaling hypothesis. So, this is where the proton beams are extracted. They really uh, from the super proton synchrotron, then they are made to collide with a nuclear target. And after that, okay, I mean, the decay product, which consists of the charged pions and kaons, they are focused and then they have to traverse a long distance where the charged pions and kaons decays to muons and neutrinos. The muons are absorbed and the neutrino comes in. And this is the so called West Area Hall, which is uh, housed a big spectrometer called Omega spectrometer. And after the, there was nothing in this path, and the beam is coming from down below okay, and going up. And then you have the uh, first detector called BEPS, then you have the CDHS. Uh, this gentleman is Donald Perkins, who was one of the main persons for the BEPS experiment. And this gentleman, you know, okay, is uh, Jack Steinberger, who was leading this, the next experiment, CDHS. And there were two others, okay, which two other experiments which are following that. So this is the BEPS, this is the biggest bubble chamber at CERN, which is called the BEPS. And this was equipped with a external beyond identification system for system uh, multiwave proportional chamber. Uh, so that was the first detector in the beam line of the neutrinos. Uh, the next ex detector which will be in the beam line was the CDHS, is a collaboration of CERN, Dortmund, Heidelberg, and I think Sackley. Uh, led by Jack Steinberger, which is a, which is a very simple detector system, which has got large number of iron absorbers with the plus key scintillators in between. And after that, we have got, got, got uh, the Gargamel detector. Then we have a, a fourth experiment for a charm. There was a proposal for a fifth experiment, but that was never second sanction because the fifth experiment is supposed to be held in on the Zura mountain and uh, Obviously, the sun was hesitant to approve an experiment as we mountain because the so-called, uh, what do you call, the green people, they will come and close down sun. So, so they never had this particular thing to happen. Oh, sorry. So, what happened is that, okay, they observed a violation of the, uh, clear violation of the, uh, what they call the, the structure functions over a large energy range of the energy transfer. And not only that, this violation they demonstrated has a logarithmic dependence. So this was the first quantitative evidence of this theory of strong interaction QCD. And that came essentially first from the, the BEPS experiment followed by the CDHS experiment. Uh, so, so, so this is still, I'm still in the 70s. So I see a log log plot. So yeah, where is the a, log depend? The scaling. No, this is this is the this is the logarithmic dependence. Okay, this is the relation between the moments, uh, two moments, the correlation between the two moments. Yeah. And this log log plot, if it is if it's a log linear plot or if it's a log log plot only shows that the dependence is, is not logarithmic. Log. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, we, 
knew by the end of, uh, well, I think in the early 70s that uh, uh, the discovery of GSI uh, demonstrated that search for a new quark flavor is best done in a high resolution spectrometer looking for a dielectron final state. Uh, he's one of the most brilliant scientists of, uh, in this field, okay, he's uh, Leo Lederman. Uh, he designed one such experiment at, uh, uh, at Fermilab looking for multiple muons, but he did not have high enough resolutions at around 3 GeV, so he missed out the discovery, but he kept on looking for that uh, at a higher mass. And lucky for him, when he was uh, using a 400 GeV proton beam, which is hitting a target of copper or platinum, uh, platinum target, uh, he found out, okay, with a mass resolution, uh, uh, I think momentum resolution with a position of 15% and possibility of studied dimuous mass spectrum above 5 GeV, he saw an enhancement of uh, thing, okay, so it is a sharply falling mass distribution and over the sharply falling mass distribution, if he subtracts the continuum, he sees a peak, okay, I mean, it, it, he initially said it could be a single peak or it could be multi, uh, two peaks uh, or doing that. So that's how, okay, I mean, he said, okay, I mean, this is a, uh, a new narrow resonance for doing that. And this was followed by experiments at E plus E minus colliders in uh, in DAISY uh, as well as uh, uh, in what you call Cornell's laboratory. And they found out there are three narrow and one broad resonance in that. Uh, so, so you can see the lowest mass state is at a mass of 9.46 GeV and it has a width of 1.3 kV, so six orders of magnitude between the mass and the width. So obviously, okay, this narrow width means, okay, you have a, a fifth quark flavor, which is a, called a beauty or a bottom, and the, the thing is, okay, I mean, the half of the mass of epsilon uh, uh, is the, what do you call it, a threshold for an open beauty production, which was discovered subsequently by the CLEO collaboration at Cornell. Uh, now comes the question of the vector bosons. Okay, now we have finished 70s and moving up to moving up in the 80s. So during this 70s, you come in that sorry. One point three KV. The, the first epsilon one, KV, I think. I, I wrote way KV. Uh, now, when you have an energy of 450 GV, or a, yes, yes, is that sharp? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, the the thing is, okay, I mean, with the beam, oh, sorry, sorry. Now, with the, uh, some sort of a, a theoretical prejudice said that the, the vector boson is expect, expected at a, at a mass around 100 GeV. And if you have a beam energy of 450 to or 800 GeV in the energy doubler at Trevatron, uh, you cannot really produce that by hitting this beam on a, a fixed target. But uh, three gentlemen, Pablo Rubia, David Klein, and Peter McIntyre proposed to use either SPS or Fermi lab rings to have a beam of antiprotons accelerated and colliding with the protons. I mean, they could be accelerated by the same, uh, I mean, they can be made to rotate by the same magnet system, but moving in the opposite direction and accelerated in, in by the same 
acceleration system and uh, somehow Fermi lab never believed that mainly because uh, they thought how can you produce antiproton beams if when you the way you produce antiprotons is that you hit protons on a nuclear target and then antiprotons which are produced are hot that means they have come out in all directions and have many energies so you have to cool it down uh, now the russians and when they were okay, I mean the russians have a uh, cooling method which is called electron cooling and Vandermeer had a cooling method called stochastic cooling and both these cooling methods were tried out as well and uh, uh, they showed okay both the cooling method works and but the stochastic cooling method is the one which is the most suitable one for this and so they could make an antiproton accumulator where they cooled down the anti and made the antiproton beam and then the antiprotons are led to the proton synchrotron of CERN and then to the superproton synchrotron so we could have a collision of uh, two 300 g for example two 300 gb protons and antiprotons against each other having a center of mass energy of about 600 gb and obviously okay you can produce 100 gb object using that so there are two experiments which are using complementary technologies which are uh, proposed uh, one by led by Carlo Rubia called EO1 which uses a magnetic spectrometer with a very hermetic uh, calorimeter and the other was uh, a group of not so famous famous physicists but they are very very sharp physicists one of them was led by Dariula he's a French physicist and he did not really make a magnetic calor spectrometer but had a very high precision calorimeter for doing the same same object and they found out to come in first uh, events of a high transverse momentum electrons with a large uh, missing transverse energy and they are correlated with each other as though a, an object is produced at rest of mass around 80 GeV and they uh, emit a uh, uh, what you call electrons and neutrinos in opposite direction and uh, with the same energy to balance each other that is an evidence of the W boson and also they have observed uh, two electrons or electrons and positrons of equal transverse energy again balancing each other and the effective mass of that is around 92 GeV. so this was the discoveries of W and Z boson sorry this um I wanted to just ask this but uh the UA1 and UA2, the uh, most of the credit goes to Carlo Rubia and you know the Nobel Prize. So somehow UA2. No, 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 no. It was they, not, they didn't get that. Really look at what the credit goes to. The credit for Carlo Rubia was the proposal of an antiproton okay. ring. Okay, it's not for the UA1 experiment. UA1 only had the seen the events, but that that you can have a uh, antiproton proton collision. That is the reason okay for the Nobel Prize. Hmm? That is and and the other thing was stochastic cooling, which went to Simon van der Meer. Uh, now in seventy-five, okay, I mean, uh, not in the se before the discovery of uh, Ws and Zs, the Sun pr proposed to have a large rings of electrons and positrons to discover Ws and Zs. And this is called the large electron positron collider. But fortunately or unfortunately, the Ws and Gs were already discovered by uh, Carlo Rubia. So, uh, but still, the experiment, uh, still the, the things are on or coming to do this thing. And what uh, CERN allowed to do that, they approved four different experiments to go in for this large electron positron collider. The, the reason for the four ex different experiment was that, okay, I mean, two of the experiments, uh, this one is, sorry, why? Uh, two of these experiments, this, this one is called Delphi, and this one is called L3. They have something special. This one designed to see uh, a pair of top quarks be produced and then it will decay like a toponium. So they had a very high resolution electromagnetic calorimeter and the muon chamber. And this guy tried to 
uh, not only see the charge particle, they also want to see what is that charge particle, is a pion or pion. So they had a, a very sophisticated particle identification system. But in addition to that, there is this guy okay, had a very large uh, superconducting solenoid and uh, that is registered in Ale. But one, after these three, okay, I mean, they all had many challenging technology. So when you have a challenging technology, okay, it might work, it might not work. So they have something which is a conventional technology and they had a fourth experiment called Opal. So this, that's why, okay, they had four experiments which is there. But now that, okay, I mean, WZ and these are discovered, what a lab could produce, the, the only thing they could produce is a very precision measurement. One of the precision measurement was looking at the, the width of the, uh, what the Z boson. And from the width of the Z boson, they said, okay, I mean, there is only three light neutrino spaces. So that is the one. The second thing they did is they, they did measure a large number of uh, quantities which are, can be explained by electroweak theories. And you can see they're all agrees, okay, with the, what, what they call the standard model prediction within a one sigma. The largest one is 2.65 sigma away, but there's only one of them. But the, at the same time, okay, I mean, all these measurements say that there is a, a, a radiative correction, which is essentially a correction based on a higher order uh, diagrams, okay, for that. And that radiative corrections are determined with a significance of five sigma. And uh, obviously, okay, that led to the one Nobel Prize, okay, to uh, two theories, Tooft and Weltman. Uh, and finally, okay, they could say, okay, I mean, they have not found the top quark, but they could say, okay, I mean, the top quark should have a mass between 145 to 185 GeV. So to, it could narrow down the search window. Before we move to the top quark search, we just come to something which happened from the 70s to the uh, early 80s. Uh, the, all the hadrons have the inner structure, but the constituents cannot be ma manifest uh, themselves as free patterns. So Feynman and Field, I mean, they gave the idea of jet formation, and the Spear experiment, they really found out, okay, that uh, in the Spear experiment, they, when they have a multi-hadronic final state, that can be explained not by a pure phase space uh, type of model, but the formation of uh, pair of jets. So a jet is like you, when the in the direction of pattern, okay, I mean you have got uh, most of the energies goes in, and in transverse direction there will be less energies going in. This one is obviously not two jet event. This is not a three jet event, and these events were found out not an an in sphere. This time, okay, Daisy was lucky, and they have a. Uh, electron positron uh, collider uh, called Petra, and they had five experiments which are proposed. In fact, after, out of these five, the first one was a, an experiment which was already there in the Doris ring, and that was moved out. That was one of the best detectors of Doris ring, and so it was moved out okay, till Chelo, Chelo experiment could be built. Uh, the Chelo experiment was a new experiment at the time, and it was employed a detector, uh, which was later on used by the future detectors, okay, which uses liquid argon uh, calorimeter for uh, detecting, I mean, for, uh, photons and electrons. Now, they observed events like this, and these two persons, I think there are four of them, okay, but from the TASO collaboration, they claimed, okay, the discovery of these gluons, but I think, okay, I mean, all the five experiments were saw the evidence of this subject, but they were the first one to claim it, okay, so the credit went to them. Uh, others, okay, I mean, when missed it by, by days, okay, that's the order. Now, these were much better done, okay, at the large electron positron collider, and what they did in large electron positron collider, okay, I mean, the, from the emission of these three jets, you can measure the uh, coupling constants for the strong interactions at various different energies. And they showed that the strong coupling constants falls as a function of energy. And this is the so-called evidence of asymptotic freedom. And again, okay, I mean, uh, 
the Nobel Prize went to the theorists, okay, who really worked out, okay, this has including freedom for the theory of strong interaction. Now we have got uh, two complete generation and one incomplete generation. So we have got five quark flavors and five leptons. So you have to see the, the six quark and the six leptons and there are indirect evidence of the six quark flavor for right from the days of the uh, Bieber P collider or the Petra from the uh, what you call the BB oscillation or uh, coupling of the other uh, Z bosons to BB bar, okay? So, so, so these are the things, okay, which gave the evidence, indirect evidence of a top quark, but the top quark was not seen before the uh, Trevatron came up with, uh, again, with two colliders, which was, it follows more or less the same principle as EV1 and EV2. EV1 had a magnetic spectrometer, CDF also has a magnetic spectrometer. EV2 uh, was, uh, have a very good uh, calorimeter and DZ also has a very good calorimeter. So these are the two major detectors at the Tevatron collider. I think my fingers are not working correctly. Yeah. So, so I think, okay, I mean, the first experiment, CDF, okay, I mean, they, they were pretty, really good, okay, they tried to find out, okay, I mean, uh, the evidence of uh, four, uh, four, four jets events, where two of the jets could be associated with the, uh, of the B jets. Uh, and uh, uh, whereas they expect to come in with 27 candidate events, they only have a background of something like seven. For the uh, B jets can be also identified with a soft lepton tag, and there they expect 15.4 uh, events, but uh, they saw 23 events. So all these excesses could give rise to, uh, could be due to the top quark. And also they have six dielectron events with an estimated background of about 1.3 events. So all these things put together, all, all these things put together, it has a 4.8 sigma evidence for top quark. And uh, they estimated the mass of the top quark, which is uh, about 175 GeV. Uh, D0 was uh, obviously was not really equipped okay, with this, so so they could not really match with the work of uh, CDF, but uh, because they do not have a good uh, charge particle measurement, so but their are clever, uh, part, what do you call, clever guys in the D0 collaboration. So what they did is that they tried to invent okay new observables by which they can see the uh, background events okay from the signal events and these are the things okay for the dielectron and this is about the single electron uh, tag events the, the solid line is for the uh, signal type event and the dash line is for the uh, uh, background type events and I think they had the first employment of the artificial intelligence okay for uh, claiming anything new. Uh, so they are said, okay, there is a 4.6 sigma observation, but their estimated mass was far too high, okay, so uh, for doing that. Now, how much time? I have no idea. Uh, 10 minutes, okay. Uh, the, uh, the third type of lip, uh, lip, uh, Lepton, that type of neutrinos, uh, was discovered by an experiment at Fermilab, uh, where they tried to utilize a okay, very high precision detector called emulsions, and they observed and uh, events where and they had a, the the so-called beam dump type of experiment where it produced all three types of neutrinos, and obviously, okay, I mean, you have got a more enhanced uh, for a production of uh, tau, tau, tau type of neutrino, mainly because the decay path of the other particles uh, are not much there. So you do not have that much of new, new or new E, but you have got more of new tau because uh, uh, the tau lepton uh, decays very fast. Uh, so, so I think, okay, they have immersion chambers and immersion chambers, they saw uh, candidates, okay, where you have got a 
uh, tau lepton, which are decaying close, I mean, they produce a tau lepton in, from, from the interaction and which decays after a short length. So, with the four events, okay, they say that we have observed neutrons. Uh, I think uh, one of the most challenging experiments was an experiment done by uh, a guy, okay, called uh, Davis, Raymond Davis. He was, uh, did one of the longest experiment from 1970 to 1994. He filled up a tank with a, 100,000 gallons of perchloroethylene and put them in a underground, okay, in a, uh, in a, in South Dakota, okay, I mean, uh, you know, so-called homestake uh, mine. Uh, and what it's supposed to do is that they said, okay, I mean, if there is a neutrino comes from the sun, uh, it will interact with this chlorine to give rise to a, 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 a what you call, a radioactive, Isotope of argon. They are, these are they are uh, flushed out from the uh, ethylene part, and then they are made to decay. And uh, and from the count of these decays, okay, they try to estimate the flux of the neutrino, flux of the uh, solar neutrino. In fact, I, I think okay, I mean, personally, I came to know about this experiment first from TIFR when I was working with one of my senior colleagues. Uh, Professor Subramanian, and he wanted to explain, okay, why we have got the seasonal variation of this uh, solar neutrino flux. But the important thing is that it's not just a senior, uh, seasonal variation of the flux is, is an issue. Also, the flux which was measured, okay, was, uh, showed a deficit from the estimate from the standard solar model. So either the standard solar model was wrong or, the, or there is a real deficit. So that was the situation from this particular experiment. Uh, then as a, uh, during the early 80s, there was a strong theoretical prejudice that protons are not stable. So there is a large number of experiments which are constructed to look at the proton decays. But this gentleman, uh, Koshiba, he wanted to design an experiment which not only can see proton decays, but also can see the neutrinos, okay, which comes, which are formed in the atmosphere by the, by the cosmic rays. So, and also the, uh, so of course, the solar neutrino. The way to do that, okay, I mean, you have to decrease, decrease the threshold for the detection elements. So he built a very large water channel curve detector for doing that. And again, okay, I mean, there was a deficit which was observed in the neutrino flux compared to the measured muon flux. So this particular experiment was enhanced by his colleague, Kazita, uh, and saw the same, same effect, okay. They saw a real deficit of the uh, neutrinos coming from either uh, from top or from the bottom. But, so there's a deficit of neutrinos. But deficit could be can come from various different reasons. So what what was the thing which could could happen? And that was finally resolved by uh, by a, an experiment done at uh, Sadbury Observatory, where they try to put in the uh, replace the water with a heavy water, so that you can look not just for the charge current interactions through which we were observing the neutrinos, also we can observe the things due to neutral current so that the detector was sensitive to all types of neutrinos. And after doing that, they saw that there was no deficit whatsoever of neutrinos and the total flux was matching with the uh, calculation of the standard total model. So, what happens in that case, okay, the one flavor of neutrinos was changing its type. For example, nu v oscillates from nu v to nu mu. Similarly, nu mu oscillates from nu mu to nu tau. So, so these are the ways, okay, I mean, they say that the neutrinos are, have oscillations, like uh, you have got a mixing of the quark flavors, you have a mixing of the, of the neutrinos. And this can happen only when they have masses. So the neutrinos have a, non-zero mass, 
and that was a violation from the uh, standard model. The standard model assumption is that the neutrinos are mass massless, which was not a prediction of anything, but but an assumption that neutrinos are massless. The other thing I would say, I just, I just skip, skip this, okay, that is we, uh, we observe the CP is not, uh, not a strictly speaking uh, symmetry, full symmetry, it, it has a small violation in the sectors between strange, uh, the second generation, but it also has a violation, it was observed that it also have a violation in the, uh, not in the second generation, but also in the third generation. And the Bill and Barber, okay, these are the Depressive minus Fuller experiment, they, they made an observation at the level of the six standard deviation, uh, or a 4.1, Standard uh, 4.1 sigma effect of sigma by in by 2001. So we have moved away from the 20th century to 21st century. So we came come to our final one. What about the Higgs boson? Now, uh, the Higgs boson uh, is an important ingredient of the standard model. And uh, but you, there was a search of this Higgs boson as on okay from the time when the Higgs boson was first postulated way back in 1964, but which was not seen by any experiment. And the first, what you call uh, model independent searches really happened when we moved to the lip, in, uh, lip uh, collider and also in the Fermi Lattice collider. And that model independent searches said that would come in the masses of new, uh, Higgs if it exists, it is above 114 GeV. And uh, Rivertron also ruled out, okay, the masses between 156 to 177 GeV. Based on this, uh, also the electric measurements, okay, the radiative correction model is correct. They said, okay, this Higgs could be lighter than about 171 GeV. So based on this, okay, I mean, the, the Large Hadron Collider was built and they had two experiments, again, uh, but this time, okay, I mean, they did not really have a complementarity, one magnetic and one non-magnetic. I think both the experiments are using magnetic spectrometer, but one uh, one of them, Atlas, uses a toroidal magnetic field. The other one has uses a solenoid magnetic field. That was the only difference between the two. Otherwise, okay, I mean, if you look at the thing, okay, they have more or less the same type, having a tracking device having calorimeters, having a muon detect detection system. So what happened is that, okay, I mean, this, uh, okay, so what the Higgs boson can decay to, Higgs boson can decay to a pair of, uh, any pair of uh, uh, objects, uh, either quarks or leptons, uh, which, uh, which has got mass. Now, if you want to do that, okay, for a pair of quarks, obviously it will be, uh, decaying mainly to a pair of big quarks, but uh, which will manifest themselves into B jets, but the mass, it will be formed by background process. So they have to go through the rare decay process of the, uh, the Higgs boson. One possibility was it decays to photons, pair of photons. Higgs does not couple to photon, Higgs couples to photons uh, uh, through a loop diagram to exchange of, for example, to a pair of Ws and or a pair of tops. Uh, now, so so I think, okay, I mean, uh, you, so that is one particular way. If you, if you have, you can detect photons with a very high precision. You can look at the effective mass of the diphoton system and you can see if it's a uh, spike over there, that could be an evidence of a new object. Or Higgs can be decaying to pair of Z bosons. One of them could be on on shell, and the other should be off mass shell. And the, both the Z decays to lepton. And the, the branching ratio for this process is uh, with the two leptonic decays is even smaller branching ratio than the pair of leptons. So these are the two channels which are uh, looked into, and they saw in both these channels they saw a clear clear peak at around 125 feet. So that is a evidence of a of a new object, and then they put together all the different uh, things. So okay, I mean, the uh, these two decay channels as well as Higgs decaying to pair of Ws. They saw 
uh, five sigma effect in both atlas and cms and they declared on the 4th of july in 2012 that we have observed a higgs boson a higgs like boson uh, in that some people believed it some people did not believe it but uh, later on they found out okay it's not just in this two uh, type of decay modes but it's uh, found out in all types of decay modes they are there starting from a dimion decays to uh, multiple decays so the angular distribution really found out okay the spin parity of this object is a scalar boson so that that is my first slide that high energy physics has an interesting field for the last past 50 years discover came slowly in a sequence the rare process came later in time in fact the sequence really helped us to understand the underlying phenomena better if all of them came at the same time we'll be at total loss and we could not really disentangle okay what what has really happened so that this type of staged thing okay really helped us some of the exciting observations led to Nobel prizes either to the experiments or to the theory theoreticians who predicted such observations i li lived through this exciting period involved in some of these path-breaking experiments uh, at the end i would say there are still several unanswered questions there are all from theoretical prejudices obviously okay there is no ex experimental evidence okay why to lead a new style of experiments but prejudices lead to new knowledge so i welcome these prejudices so the journey will not end now and it will continue till we really find the truth that's all I say. Oh, thank you Thank you, uh, Shandala. Uh, questions from uh, uh, first. I'll take some questions from the Zoom audience. Um, are there any questions from the Zoom audience? Uh, okay. Ha. Huh, TP. Yes. TP. Uh, hello, Shandala. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Can you hear me? I hope. Yes. Yes. So my question is. Uh, in the last three decades or so, we have not found any evidence for a fourth generation fermion. On the contrary, we could show that there are no more than three neutrino species. Is there some decisive experiment one might be able to do, which will establish that there are no more than three generations? Well, I think uh, all it says, I mean, there are only three light neutrino spaces. So having a, a neutrino which is not coupled to Z bosons, obviously it could be there. We do not say anything for that. Now I'm talking about uh, say charged leptons and quarks. Um, maybe there are only three generations. We have, um, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, all the searches for a fourth generation have yielded so far null results uh, in the context of the, what do you call the uh, LSE experiment. But still people are, uh, have not stopped looking for a post generation. Thank you. Uh, the glue glue to Higgs cross section measurement uh, essentially constrains fourth generation charged heavy quarks. So you can't have any more charged heavy quarks. I mean, uh, what is meant by heavy? Heavier than the top, is it? Heavier than the top. Yeah. Oh, that's a very strong result. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I don't believe in any indirect, indirect conclusions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's one question from Shri. No, it's not a question, it's a comment on the last one. The S parameter at the measured in lip, uh, that already shows you that you cannot have another sequential fourth generation, unless you do something very strange kind of fine tuning. Most of that fine tuning also went away with the Higgs mess. So now you have to introduce some two kinds of fine tuning to do it. So it's become a far fetched. But essentially with the measurement to the S parameter, so that's why after that, people have only looked at vector-like fermions, which yeah. don't contribute to the s right. Okay. Uh, Vivek? Vivek? Yeah. yeah. 
uh, I have a comment and a question. Let me just give the comment first. You mentioned, uh, you know, Ponte Corvo uh, in some other in the context of neutrino oscillation. Actually, he also had proposed the experiment which Davis eventually did. And in fact, Davis uh, wrote to him saying that, would you be doing this experiment? And he said, no, no, you, I mean, I'm not planning on this experiment. Please go ahead. So that was the background. Bacall and uh, Davis actually did this, got this experiment done. Uh, the question is, uh, I mean, what is your opinion on the, you know, possibilities for the future of uh, high energy particle physics? The LHC, ILC, or is it a, maybe a 100 TeV collider? Proton, proton collider. Hello, could you hear me? Hi, yes, yes, Vivek, we okay. got the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. got the question, Vivek, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, the whole point is uh, these days the energy physics is so expensive. Uh, it, it is a difficult choice, okay? So so I think, okay, the, one of the things they try to do is some, again, okay, motivated by some theoretical prejudices. And one of the theoretical prejudices is to have a much sharper, uh, measure precision, uh, precision measurements uh, at the scales of vector bosons, at the scales of the Higgs bosons, and at the scales of the uh, top quark. Now, this can be done, okay, with the electron positron colliders. Now, uh, on the other hand, okay, I mean, these are all indirect measurements, and the, then to really move forward, a direct measurements is required, and the direct measurements are uh, highest energy proton proton collider, colliders. Now, what you try to balance between the two is something is uh, uh, really is a fight between the uh, two types of people. Most likely, the people with the precision measurements will win, and uh, but I think okay, I mean, that's the direction where both CERN and China is moving. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Sudeshna? Professor Sudeshna Banerjee? Yeah. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Why can't I see you? Um, yeah. <clears throat> you don't need to see me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, the thing is, um, uh, thanks for a nice uh, historical uh, talk. Uh, many of the information, you know, uh, I really would like to revise. Through your talk, I got a lot of information. Uh, I just have one comment on your uh, D0 top result. So the result you showed was very preliminary. Uh, later on, after a few years, D0 added a magnet to the detector and the top mass measurement was uh, equally precise I and mean, same as uh, CDM. Uh, so there they did very good. And uh, D0 actually was one of the first uh, experiments to um, apply multivariate analysis techniques uh, to find the top uh, quark mass uh, you know, through the data they got. So that was a, a good achievement for D0. So though in the beginning, they did not have as, as much precision as CDF, but later on they managed. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I only refer to that discovery paper. I did not go, go beyond the discovery paper. So that was the reason okay, I did not talk about uh, when they uh, understood their mistake okay, and then put in the magnets and so on and so forth. But I also always give credit to the artificial intelligence which is employed by DC for the first time. Yeah, yeah, thanks. On the comment made by my Professor Shunandu, it is uh, regarding the future colliders which are going to come up. Linear collider uh, will come up much earlier, electron positron, because the technology is halfway through. Still, a lot more uh, research needs to be done. And 100 TV future collider will take several decades. No, no that's, that was precisely okay. I did not say okay, it will be linear or circular collider. I only said the E plus E minus against the proton proton. So you mentioned these uh, different magnetic uh, uh, kind of field configurations for ATLAS and CMS. So what's the advantage of a toroidal uh, configuration? So what can ATLAS do with it? With, uh, the, so the main thing is, okay, how the momentum measurement uncertainty is a function of the, the 
error on the momentum measurement as a function of the momentum. In a, uh, if you have a solenoidal magnet, uh, you have a very high precision at the lowest, at the low momentum, but when the momentum is larger, the delta, the sigma p over p becomes large. In a toroidal magnet, you do not get such a good momentum measurement at the low momentum, but at high momentum, you are is the other way around. You are you do much better okay, at high momentum compared to a solenoidal magnet. Are involved with the electric precision measurement at LEAP for a long time. Now, recent uh, measurements you have seen the seven sigma away from the standard model prediction. The question is, what is your intake? And if you think, is there any plan to recheck the LEAP uh, measurement in order to prove or disprove that? Uh, I don't think okay, I mean, there is a provision of rechecking going back with the lip, lip measurements. That is almost out. Okay, we uh, don't have any access to, to the data. We, uh, the data storage system was not as good as it, as it is today. Uh, I, I think, uh, but uh, we have to rely on the things okay, which Atlas or uh, CMS do okay, for doing that. Uh, I never believe any measurement done by a single experiment, uh, unless it is collaborated collabor with uh, some other thing. I was involved in one experiment where we found a five sigma effect okay, of finding some an object at uh, 2.6 GV. We published that, and it was turned out to be a statistical fluctuation by repeating similar measurement done by other experiments. So with that background of things in my in my thing, okay, I mean, I never would believe anything which was done by a single experiment. Uh, and it could be on this uh, other experiments prove it. And if you really see for many things, okay, I mean, you can have seen observation, no observation, observation, no observation, and then it tries to reach to some type of thing okay, where it go, goes heavily in one direction. That is where we come in one has to believe it. Okay. Last, last question. Yeah, last question about your last part one point. This is that they are all theoretical prejudices, but this is a dark matter. I think this is the observations we see. This is the experimental observation. Well, I think okay, I mean, but it does not say okay, but where the dark matter would be okay. Should it be in part something is there. Uh, but okay. Govinda, it could be okay. modified gravity, not dark matter. Not dark. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We will. Uh, on that note, we will conclude this colloquium and let's thank uh, uh, Professor Shunando Energy again for a, a very nice summary of uh, all the last fifty years of experiments in high energy physics. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I request all of you to join in the West Canteen for a little bit of snacks and uh, tea. Um, I would also like to remind uh, that next week we'll have uh, one of our own young members, Professor Malay Patra from Chemical Sciences giving a colloquium. So thank you. <laughs>